Okay, everyone, um, welcome to uh, the Phage um, uh, meeting that we're having today. Um, as an introduction for those who haven't been to any of these before, this is a global coalition, the Public Health Alliance for Genomic Epidemiology, working towards establishing various consensus standards, documents, sharing best practices, um, advocating for openness of data, and so on and so forth. Um, today, we've got two speakers. Um, our first speaker is um, Anita Gansa, I hope I pronounced that correctly, um, from uh, the Parasitology Department of Noguchi Memorial Institute in the University of Ghana, um, working on translational research in malaria and other infectious parasitic diseases, and trying to apply genomic research output to informing malaria control and elimination. So um, I'm going to hand over to um, Anita, who's going to take us through her talk now. Thank you very much for the introduction and good afternoon, good evening to you all. Um, I must say it's a pleasure and I'm grateful for this invitation. So today I'm going to talk to you about malaria genomics and bioinformatics for public health in Ghana. Um, so this is going to be the outline of my presentation. I'll give you a background, it's not to bore you, but just so those who do not have that, um, who are not up to speed with malaria will get the background. And then we'll look at public health relevance of malaria genomics and bioinformatics and where we are at as a nation and looking forward, what we want to do with um, bioinformatics and genomics in Ghana, the challenges and drawbacks, and then we'll conclude. So malaria is an acute febrile illness caused by plasmodium parasites transmitted by the female anopheline mosquito. There are five different plasmodium species that affect humans, namely plasmodium falciparum, malaria, ovali, bivax, and nozai. And we know that um, falciparum and bivax are the greatest threats. So over the years, the disease burden is reducing. We see that um, between 2000 and 2019, we have seen a reduction in malaria morbidity and mortality, even though we still see that the progress has stalled between 2010 and um, 2015. If you look at what happened, but there's still a major reduction in malaria mortality. And of course, the morbidity has also reduced. And two thirds of the deaths were among children under the age of five. And the progress we made was as a result of extensive chemotherapy and vector control interventions. And we saw an 18% decrease in mortality since 2010. But we see that still the malaria burden is very high and the efforts to control malaria is being hindered by insecticide and anti-malaria drug resistance. So what we would need is an effective vaccine um, that will add to our tools for control and elimination. Now we have one moderately efficacious vaccine that is the RTSS ASO1 vaccine, which was recently approved by WHO for routine immunization of children and that, or above six months. So the epidemiology of malaria in Ghana, from our map, you see that Ghana has also made progress as the world reduces malaria morbidity from 2002 through to 2016. And it still remains a major public health concern, all right. It forms 2% of the global malaria cases and 3% of deaths. That is the country, Ghana. And it's one of the 11 highest burden countries designated by WHO. And 41% of our outpatient department attendance is the result of malaria. And then 18% of admission and point nine percent of deaths occurring in the country. 
we have Plasmodium falciparum, the main parasite species circulating in our population. We also have P. malaria and Ovali in low um, frequencies. And we have some very low mixed infections of P. malaria or Ovali and falciparum. And our vectors are Anopheles gambi, SL, and Anopheles finestus. So the prevalence of malaria of um, malaria parasites in children under five in 2019. So the national average was 14% and it ranged between 2.4 in the greater Accra region and then 27% in the Western region. So this is greater Accra than the Western region with the rural settings averaging around 19.6%. The national strategic plan is estimating about 19% reduction in malaria mortality and a 50% reduction in cases by 2025 using the 2019 data as baseline. Now, through the implementation of a mix of intervention, the country has now positioned six districts out of over 200 districts to achieve pre-elimination by 2025. Now, this is not to bore you with a life cycle, but I want to stress the complexity of the life cycle, which results in extensive genetic diversity. And that is what we tap into for all our surveillance or um, activities for malaria control using genetics. So we know that the life cycle begins with the inoculation of sporozoids by the female anophelin mosquito as it takes its blood meal from humans. And this um, circulates in the bloodstream and quickly into the hepatocytes where it matures and releases sporozoids. Now the sporozoids, releases merozoids. So the merozoids will now infect the red blood cells and also mature. Now, when the merozoids burst after extensive asexual um, reproduction, it releases um, gametocytes and a lot of merozoids, which would further invade new red blood cells and the cycle continues in the red blood cells. Now, on another bite or feeding of a mosquito, it will pick these gametocytes in the red blood cells and then undergo sexual um, reproduction and matures that these zygotes will then further develop until we get to the sporozoite development and wait for the next um, blood meal. So during the human phase, like in most um, cell cycle processes, we find mutations occurring and these mutations can be point mutations or gene duplications or um, um, indels. And we tap these for our activities, you'll see later. Now, most of the diversity that we'll find in the malaria parasite as during the sexual stages, stages. When we have co-transmission of um, more than one strain by the mosquito or super infection, when one is bitten by more than one mosquito carrying um, different strains of the parasite. And so during um, sexual reproduction, there is, genetic recombination and introduction of at least 50% or maximum of 50% of these new strains and this further circles. And so diversity is obtained most extensively in this sexual stage. Now, what are some of the ways that we can capitalize on the extensive genetic diversity of the malaria parasites? For public health, the public health practitioner is interested in how interventions they put in place are working. So 
anti-malaria therapies, how they are working, or the efficacy of these interventions, vaccine efficacy, insecticide, and then their diagnostic tools. And then they're also interested in the parasite population dynamics to understand what is happening with parasites in terms of importation or interbreeding or how an area that was deemed um, either malaria eliminated or not, there is an introduction of the parasite. They're interested in what is happening, what kind of parasites this population is harboring. So how do we use genetic diversity to estimate, um, to look at anti-malaria resistance? Our interest is to understand the emergence and spread of resistance for us, because our main um, species is a plasmodium falciparum, I'm going to focus on that. And for this presentation, I'll focus on drug resistance and vaccine efficacy as two ways that we are using genetic diversity to inform public health activities in Ghana. So we use it to track outbreaks to determine the development and movement of these resistant lineages. So this we do by looking at uh, microsatellite repeats in regions around resistant markers. And then we generally genotype and estimate the prevalence of resistant markers. We are also interested in the genetic relatedness as we see with migration. We look at um, considering diversity in the global parasite population and with our local parasite population to understand the origin or how parasites have migrated. And we look at different scenarios of migration because we need to understand or be able to discern between an external introduction of a parasite, the parasite movement between areas and mixing or interbreeding in a given area. And this, these kind of analytical methods are what can be used operationally in decision-making. Now, so where are we as a nation in terms of genetics or bioinformatics or genomics for malaria control? So since 2002, the Noguchi Memorial Institute for Medical Research, where I work, has partnered the National Malaria Control Program in a number of activities, um, including malaria molecular surveillance, using the therapeutic efficacy studies and molecular marker surveillance for drug resistance. Insecticide resistance came along after a while. And then recently, we are tracking HRP2 gene deletions for the rapid diagnostic testing. But as I said, my focus will be on drug resistance and vaccine efficacy. Now, through our activities in 2002, the country found that we had chloroquine resistance ranging between 6% and 25%, and parasite clearance rates was as low or below even 50%. And these studies were for the first time backed by genotyping of molecular markers of anti-malaria resistance in the country. And this study informed the change from chloroquine or sulfadoxin perimetamine to the use of artemisinin-based combination therapy in Ghana. Now, since then, we've been monitoring the re-expansion of chloroquine sensitive parasites and the emergence of resistance to artemisinin through the WHO protocol for um, therapeutic efficacy studies. I'm not going into the study itself, but as part of this study, we also used PCR and restriction fragment length polymorphism to track um, either reinfection or recrudescence in any infection. And through these activities, we know that the artemisinin based combination therapy 
or artemisinin is very efficacious across Ghana. We have over 90% efficacy if we do PCR correction. Now, we also monitor anti-malaria resistance by doing in vivo testing, ex vivo testing, and then we track resistance or confirm resistance as a cause of treatment failure using the genotyping of anti-malaria molecular markers and it, the changing prevalence of these markers of resistance in geographical areas may serve as early warning signals. So this is integrated in the malaria control programs activities. Now, these are the anti-malaria resistant markers that we monitor, or not all of them. It's actually depending on how much funds we have. And we do it for some sites, we go there every two years or once a year, depending on how much money we can afford. And in some cases to research activities will absorb some of the sites or the sentinel sites that the malaria control program is interested in to free the control program of some of the funds to look at other things. So PFCRT, PFMDR1, DHFR, and so on. We look at mutations, polymorphisms within these codons for various combination of um, antimalarials or drugs. For the PFK13, that is associated or linked with artemisinin resistance. We look at the propeller domain region. And then for PFMDR1, if you're interested in mefloquine or lumifantrine resistance, we look at changes in copy number. And for plasmepsin 2 and 3 that are associated with um, piperaquine resistance, we are interested in changes in copy number. So these are some of the results we've obtained from conducting these simple genotyping by PCR and RFLP. And we feed the control program with the prevalence of various markers of resistance. And that is what they are interested in. We also look at copy number variation and inform the program about where we are at with the various drugs. They're also interested in looking at selective sweeps and lineages of plasmodium falciparum. As I said, we want to see whether selection is keeping these very diverse parasite population going. And then we want to track the origin of the parasites or origin of resistant alleles by looking at um, microsatellites flanking these resistance regions of the parasite. Now, when there is any intervention, for instance, if we are using sulfadoxin perimetamine, which is used for um, preventing malaria in pregnant women, we also try to look at the spread of SP resistance. We also assess interventions. This was a study that an area was sprayed by doing this indoor residual spraying in the northern part of Ghana for a period of four years. And again, we used um, this time not PCR and RFLP analysis, but we use the molecular barcode or the um, HRM, high resolution melting assay to genotype the same markers of resistance and looked at the trends of these markers pre and post intervention. Now, of interest to us is also any vaccine candidate. So the RTSS vaccine, which was recently approved or approved by WHO for routine use as 
uh, um, the gene used for this RTSS vaccine is a fragment of the circumsporozoic protein, which is a protein on the surface of the sporozoid, as the name implies. And remember, the sporozoid is injected into the liver cells. Now, so it blocks the sporozoid stage of the parasite. Now, the gene is used for the vaccine construct. It has a repeat region, and then this part of its C-terminal region comprises this um, vaccine construct. Now, so the, I think the last 16 repeats, the NAMP repeats, and the whole of the C-terminal region are used for the vaccine. The central repeat region has got an immunodominant B cell epitope, which is recognized by antibodies that prevent um, invasion or prevent the sporozoite from invading the hepatocytes. And then the C terminal region also has got. Um, TH2R and TH3 coding regions. And these regions would code for these epitopes. And then these T cells will be formed that also would inhibit the invasion of the hepatocytes by the malaria parasites. And the vaccine. It's made up of um, the hepatitis B, four hepatitis B um, antigen to support it, and the adjuvant also helps it. Now, what we did, because we know that there is a lot of um, studies on this vaccine and the efficacy of the vaccine was very low. We also decided to look at the population genetics of the CSP in Ghana. And our results from two sites where one site has got um, seasonal malaria transmission and the other site low to moderate malaria transmission. But the seasonal malaria transmission area has got very high transmission you see the extensive genetic diversity in the CSP. And this circle I'm showing is the vaccine strain. And the problem with the vaccine has been strain-specific immunity. So clearly, the vaccine would have um, efficacy issues, even in different locations in Ghana. We also see the um, shared haplotypes in this region, an indication of gene flow and very location specific evolutionary processes occurring in the vaccine. We see that at one of the sites, the blue that indicated in blue is already under strong selection. So, such a study will inform the public health policymakers about the efficacy or what they should expect of the efficacy of the vaccine. Now, the summary of the work we've done on drug resistance so far in Ghana indicates that 13 years after the change in drug policy, the chloroquine sensitive parasite strains with a PFCRTK76 have increased and they are nearing fixation in some parts of the country. Now, PFMDR184F bearing parasites under strong selection, and this is due to one of the atomicin partner drugs, lumifantrine, which is, as expected, being selected for. So um, mutations in lumifantrine are being selected for as a result of the drug pressure. Now, the DHFR and DHPS quintuple genotype 
which is associated with sulfadoxin pyrimetamine resistance, is near saturation in the country. Even though the drug is still being used as um, part of the combination, as part of um, prevention of malaria in pregnant women, because we still do not have some of the key or high prevalence of some of the key mutations that are associated with resistance to the drug. But using some sensitive methods, we found the emergence of some of the very um, mutations that are associated with the failure of SP. Now from 2% to 10%, we find DHPS581 in our population, which needs continuous monitoring. We have a low prevalence of the RTSS ASO1 vaccine strain in most parts of Ghana. And then we have a high prevalence of polyclonal infections in our country. This is a problem for most of the analytical tools. In, on some occasions, you will lose so much data because um, most of the tools, the bioinformatics tools will work with only monoclonal infections. Now, HRP2 deletions have been detected in Ghana. And this deletion is in the gene that is used for the rapid diagnostic kit. And it's of course being monitored by the public health officials. We do not have any validated K13 markers associated with artemisinin resistance observed in Ghana yet. Now, most of these studies are simple genetic analysis that we've conducted. Aware of the genomic error, we've also tried to improve on our activities using um, some of the new tools available. So for genotyping molecular markers of anti-malaria resistance, we have looked like at the molecular inversion probe capture and amplification method. So the molecular inversion probe capture uses the probe, which is a linear um, probe. Now what it does is that it captures your gene of interest. So your target is captured through hybridization to this probe. And then you get a cellular and inverted um, DNA material before you conduct any amplification. Now you use exonucleases to remove all uncaptured targets before you do your amplification and then deep sequencing. So the advantage of this is that you're able to target so many regions in the genome at a time. So it's highly multiplexed. And so we thought that we could try that to see whether we'll be able to track any emerging resistance to artemisinin in our country before it spreads. Now, this is a workflow when you're doing the MIP capturing and genotype. So the same blood samples from the surveillance studies are used. You isolate your DNA, do your MIP capture and amplification, and high throughput sequencing, you're using the MySeq platform, and then it goes through the bioinformatic analysis. And then we obtain the same data as we have in the past using the more tedious PCR RFLP process. And with the molecular inversion probe as well, we've been able to pick these mutations that were previously not found in our population, and they are also being monitored, especially for the SP resistance that is still the drug that is still being used for IPTP to prevent malaria in pregnant women. Now we are aware of the cost of doing these um, next generation sequencing. So we are looking at ways of cutting down costs. Even though with our molecular inversion for how multiplexable it is, we save a lot of costs. We are still thinking about ways of improving on it. So our next approach is pulling of samples for the surveillance of drug resistance. We have tried pulling 100 samples from one site 
So here are two sites. We've pulled 100 samples before. We took it through the same molecular invasion probe capture and sequencing. And our data gave us over 97% concordance when these same pooled samples were genotyped individually. We have tried, we are still optimizing these methods and we intend to expand the study. We think that with the pooling plus the MIP capturing, we will be able to use NGS and quickly pick any emerging artemisinin resistant um, parasite in our population. It's our vision that this pooling may be taken to every hospital in Ghana in the, next, in the near future. We think that the pooling may be an excellent way to monitor for other infectious diseases as well. It can be used to monitor the population level frequency of variations of interest, such as drug resistance, strain types, or virulence factors in other infections. It can also be used to monitor the occurrence of particular infections within the pool. So a pool of malaria negative febrile illnesses can be monitored for viral hemorrhagic diseases. Now, human traits of public health importance can be determined for particular facilities. For instance, the frequency of sickle cell mutations or G6PD mutations in areas proposed for primaquine treatment. Now, the overall efficient cost-effective sampling with next generation sequencing may afford and greatly expand systems and measures in developing countries where this information is most needed, but cost is prohibitive to it. So what is the way forward for us? I think that we need, um, we should, we need to use highly multiplexed targeted sequencing and whole genome sequencing approaches to conduct large scale temporal and spatial monitoring of resistance and parasite populations to ascertain the efficacy of interventions such as chemotherapy, vector control measures and vaccines in Ghana. We also need to develop optimal strategies to help track outbreaks, to determine the development and movement of resistant lineages, as opposed to simply just identifying whether resistance is prevalent or not, or is present or not, or just providing the prevalence of resistant markets. Now, we need these optimal strategies to determine ultimate markets that will help us understand importation. Because for importation, we need to understand or be able to discern between external introduction, parasite movement between areas within the same population, or mixing or interbreeding in a given area. Now, what is the best marker for tracking transmission within a community? We also need to assess human variations and parasite variations. For instance, looking at HLA versus the CSP protein variation in order to understand the low efficacy of our RTSS vaccine is one of the studies that we are conducting. We need to model and use statistical analysis to deal with the polyclonality of our infections in our very high endemic areas like Ghana and to model large scale and temporal genetic data sets. Now, what are some of the challenges and drawbacks? So the key operational challenges and areas of opportunity for improvement include capacity building, utility. Sorry to interrupt. We're, we're running out of time, Anita. So if you, okay. if you can wrap, wrap it up, um, we can get maybe one question in. Thanks. All right. Okay. So meaningful collection of data. We need an increased capacity in sequencing, standardization of our methods, and the acceptance of genetic epidemiology by various stakeholders and commitment and buy-in by um, stakeholders. We need a platform 
or database that will help us improve our monitoring that will link um, our traditional epidemiology data with the genetics data. Yes, in conclusion, I'll say that there is a growing acceptance of genomics into programmatic decisions, but there's still a lot that we have to do. How applicable will this be? What's, what are the research questions of interest to the program? And then the ethics of genetic use of genetic material, data sharing and data use. Um, are the methods comparable? We need standards and we need clear guidance on priority sets and, and policy relevance to these questions for most studies that are of immediate policy relevance. So I think I'll end here and I would like to thank everybody for the attention and I'll take questions. Thanks. Thanks for a great talk, Anita. Um, we are very short on time and I don't want to, um, uh, I want to make sure there's enough time for work as next. So maybe we can just ask one question, which was around the HLP2 gene deletions um, from Hesborn. So asking whether that correlated to false negative results um, or whether with your high level of um, polyclonal infections, actually um, it didn't affect the outcome of the RDTs. Thank you very much. So the HRP2 deletion is correlated with false um, positive results. So what they do is to use the rapid diagnostic test kits that are made from the HRP2 genes with the HRP2 and the non-HRP2 and microscopy. So if a test is negative for the non-HRP2 but positive for the HRP2, then they take it further and sequence, and then they find that there is a deletion, or this is a false positive. Okay. Okay, Th thanks very much, Anita. Um, in the interest of time, we'll move on. So our next speaker is from the Aga Khan University, um, Wakas, uh, Wakasudin Khan, sorry, uh, my apologies. So uh, working on uh, genomics of cardiovascular related disorders um, previously and currently using multiomics to decipher various markers um, uh, for the improvement of maternal and neonatal child health. And so I'll quickly jump across um, to Wakas um, and uh, yeah, I'll take it from here. Thanks. Thanks, uh, thanks, Daniel, for a very uh, nice introduction, uh, uh, and great thanks uh, to the uh, Fitch Consortium to organize all this uh, Fitch monthly webinars. And so, uh, so today I, I will talk about the uh, overview of overview of uh, SARS-CoV-2 genome sequencing and um, where does Pakistan stand in this uh, pandemic. So I do not, do not have any disclosure statement. Uh, so before going into the details of genomic epidemiology of Pakistan, let's talk about the epidemic profile of COVID-19 in Pakistan. So uh, uh, Pakistan uh, uh, is a highly populous country uh, located in South Asia, and uh, it has a population of 220 million people. And if you see the map of uh, Pakistan, so it has different states, uh, for example, Azad Jammu and Kashmir, located towards the north, the uh, southern part is Balochistan, and then we have Sin, the central part Punjab, uh, having our uh, capital Islamabad and the uh, uh, Gilgit Baltistan. So uh, uh, since uh, December 1, 2019 till uh, yesterday, so the epidemic profile of COVID-19 is Pakistan. So we have more than, uh, still we have uh, in the last 24 hours, we have uh, approximately 700 positive cases and the active cases uh, are uh, in the last 24 hours. So the active cases are still uh, 23,000. And if you see, uh, uh, we have uh, very uh, high, I mean, uh, as far as the uh, population is concerned, so we have that of 28,000. And uh, still we have uh, recoveries of uh, more than 1.2 million. So in last 22, uh, uh, in last 24 hours, we have a good recovery rate as well. Uh, but uh, if you see the daily uh, COVID-19 cases is in Pakistan. So since last one month, so it's really very healthy to see that we uh, we have uh, decrease the number of cases, and uh, I think uh, in the last uh, in last week we have a day that has the lowest uh, COVID nineteen cases reported. So uh, uh, I would like to share uh, one uh, 
uh, one diagram from this uh, publication. And as you can see uh, in Pakistan, if you compare Pakistan with the rest of the country, for example, uh, Afghanistan, India, Nepal, Iran, and Bangladesh, and specifically uh, uh, Pakistan touches the borders of Afghanistan, India, uh, uh, and Iran. And as you can see, the uh, uh, daily number, uh, the daily number of confirmed cases, uh, uh, as far as in comparison to the daily test from uh, as comparison to the daily test performed, is still lower. So, uh, so uh, our government, government of Pakistan, did something great. Uh, uh, for example, uh, lockdown strategies or smart lockdown strategies, even uh, micro lockdown. So, our uh, daily confirmed cases never exceeds the uh, daily test per uh, the daily test perform uh, but if you compare the same situation with the, our uh, neighbors and uh, in uh, india and bangladesh so uh, they have uh, they had a quite a hard hitting wave of uh, delta variants and uh, especially the fourth wave of coronavirus so uh, the situation in uh, pakistan uh, as far as daily number uh, daily confirmed number of cases are concerned so we are uh, have a very we applied uh, deployed a very good strategy of uh, sars cov 2 genome testing and the and the surveillance as well so uh, uh, if you rank uh, uh, pakistan as far as the distribution of cases are concerned and if you see this uh, world meter uh, uh, I mean, uh, United States uh, has 18.96% uh, share in all the SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, cases. And um, if you see uh, where the Pakistan lies, so uh, Pakistan uh, is, comes in between Sweden and Belgium. And uh, Sweden has 0.48% uh, uh, share of distribution of positive cases uh, in, com in comparison to the Belgium that has 0.54%. And in between uh, uh, Sweden and Belgium, Pakistan stands where we uh, distributed, uh, we shared 0.52% uh, positive number of cases. So uh, uh, if you compare the Pakistan, uh, taking Pakistan as a, a developing country and the, as a part of a low and middle income country. So uh, the situation of Pakistan or the ranking of Pakistan is somewhere lies uh, between uh, these two uh, uh, European countries. So uh, if you see the genomic sequence sharing uh, of uh, Belgium and Sweden, so they are a bit higher. For example, uh, uh, they uh, contributed 4.46% uh, of their uh, uh, COVID-19 positive cases, and, and this uh, percent uh, goes to the 58,239 genome sequences, SARS-CoV-2 genome sequences. Uh, same goes with the Sweden. But if you take the same number of cases, uh, for example, between the four, uh, between the uh, uh, 0.54 and 0.48% of student cases, so uh, Pakistan uh, shared only uh, 1,311 sequences, 11 SARS-CoV-2 genome sequences. Uh, that represents only 0.103% of all SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, positive cases. So there's a really alarming uh, situation as far as the number of positive cases are concerned and as far as the uh, other uh, uh, gene, the shading of genome sequence are concerned into the PSA databases. Uh, so, uh, uh, so uh, if you compare uh, Pakistan with the Belgium and Sweden, so both are highly developed countries, but if you see the whole region, uh, for example, in Asia, uh, and especially if you observe all those countries that near or surrounding or touch the border of Pakistan. Uh, for example, if you uh, observe uh, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, even Bhutan has no share, but uh, China has 5.03% uh, uh, share of all the uh, SARS-CoV-2 positive cases. Uh, here comes the Pakistan and it uh, has shares just 0.103%. Uh, so if you observe the median base to deposition, so Pakistan, the share of SARS-CoV-2 genome sequencing to the GIS-8 uh, databases, the open access database. So it, it deposited after every 51 days. Uh, so uh, as of uh, yesterday, so we have uh, 1,312 SARS-CoV-2 genomes are available. Uh, and if you uh, distribute uh, uh, all uh, Pakistan SARS-CoV-2 uh, distribution uh, of all the genome sequencing division, uh, as far as their division is concerned, for example, in different cities, so we have higher share from uh, our uh, capital Islamabad. Uh, we have uh, uh, share from the uh, largest metropolitan city of Pakistan, Karachi, uh, that has share of 207 SARS-CoV-2 genome sequencing. But uh, 
uh, one thing is not up to the mark, which is the uh, metadata. So metadata is really very crucial if you are observing the genomic epidemiology of as a, of any a bacterial or uh, viral outbreak. Uh, but it seems a problem over here because uh, uh, if you observe, uh, if you download all these sequences and the associated data or the contextual data of all these sequences, uh, so we observe that we have uh, uh, some situation like this that, for example, 92 sequences have blank spaces. So uh, some meters are uh, not very sure. They, they didn't know where the sequences are coming from. Same goes for uh, for, uh, for the uh, Punjab. Punjab is not uh, the name of a city; it is a state. Uh, but uh, uh, Sumitra just wrote uh, uh, Punjab in 64 uh, submitted sequences. And same goes for uh, Islamabad and Islamabad capital. Uh, territory ICT. So uh, this is sort of a zoom out situation as far as the uh, uh, the uh, sample collection place is concerned. Uh, so, uh, 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 so if you uh, distribute the data on the basis of sample collection data, so as we can see that during the fourth wave, when Pakistan struck the fourth wave of SARS-CoV-2, so we have higher contribution uh, of sample collection data during these days. And after this, uh, we have a, a higher number of uh, sample collection um, uh, uh, from till August 2021 and up till now. Since we are observing low COVID cases right now, and as you can see, since the uh, uh, last couple of weeks or so, the number of sequence submission to uh, from the Pakistan is almost none. So the same situation we observe um, uh, uh, in the uh, uh, in the uh, first quarter of this year, uh, when we are not aware of so Delta uh, variant, but once we have uh, uh, more uh, Delta variants, so then we once again started to sequence. So this is, uh, you can say, the uh, ups and down uh, uh, of uh, SARS-CoV-2 genome sequencing from Pakistan. So uh, uh, if you distribute the data on the basis of uh, uh, gender, uh, so we have uh, 653 cases from male, 461 cases from female. But once again, uh, the metadata seems to be not enough. Uh, and we have 198 sequences that have no uh, gender specified. Uh, same goes for the uh, age, uh, which is deposited in air as well, except this in months. So we have, uh, uh, you can say, uh, uh, between the uh, mid 20s till late 40s uh, or late uh, or early 50s, we have good submission of data as far as age is concerned. But still, uh, we have huge number of sequences where age is not specified, and it is one of the very basic uh, contextual data or metadata uh, uh, requirement that once you have a sample and once if you are investigating any viral or bacterial outbreak, and if you are planning to perform genomic epidemiology, so for example, the place, uh, sample collection date, gender, age. So these are very uh, basic uh, uh, mandatory data that you really need to. Uh, highly utilized for the purpose of sequencing. So the sequence is not just for sequencing, for sequencing. So once you are going to sequence, so there should be some uh, purpose, for example, genomic epidemiology or or any uh, investigation. Otherwise, uh, if you submit your sequence uh, without this basic metadata, so I, I think uh, uh, so. So so there's a high probability that uh, you miss so many uh, Im uh, important uh, gaps. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, so besides the uh, basic uh, 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 epidemiological profiling, so if you check the quality of genome sequencing data, which is supported by uh, by metadata, uh, so uh, we have a, a total thirty hundred twelve sequences, but. Uh, if you go to the, uh, if you make different filtering combinations or different filtering uh, strategies to check the quality or the robustness of Pakistan SARS CoV 2 genomic data. So, for example, uh, if you select all those sequences that have complete genomes, so according to the definition of GSET, you should have more than 39,000 nucleotides, less than 1% ends of undefined basis, means the ambiguous cores or the mixed sites, and you should have less than 5% ends. So, after filtering this criteria, you have uh, uh, 1,250 number of sequences. Uh, if you opted for second uh, option, for example, uh, second filtering criteria is about the uh, selecting the high coverage genomes, for example, less than 1% M's and less than 0.05% unique amino acids mutations or private uh, mutations to the sample. So you have 1,312 the same, uh, the same amount of uh, data. Uh, but if you go to exclude those sequences that have 5% N's, so you have uh, once again less number of sequences. And if you go for different strategies, for example, if you combine all four, uh, for example, A, B, C, and D, and the D ones that have 
the data uploaded uh, with the patient status. For example, uh, the patient is hospitalized uh, on, vent uh, on ventilators, uh, whether the uh, sample is uh, coming from the patient that has symptomatic or, or asymptomatic uh, symptoms of SARS-CoV-2 uh, of, uh, of COVID-19. So then you have a very low number of sequences remain to further analysis. Uh, anything which I want to uh, include uh, uh, over here, that once you have the uh, A plus C, for example, complete genomes, or, and then you exclude uh, low coverage genomes, you uh, have uh, more than a thousand se sequences, which still indicates that uh, at least we can go to some extent the genomic epidemiology part of Pakistani SARS-CoV-2 data. So uh, considering all these facts uh, I just showed you, so uh, so the point is uh, uh, what we are doing at, at EKU. So uh, so a couple of years ago, we started to uh, uh, to perform some comprehensive genomic analysis to identify novel preventive diagnostic and therapeutic approaches. Uh, so uh, so at the time, the cost of running sequencing experiment was a bit expensive, and our funders asked us to transfer samples to US uh, uh, for low cost sequencing. So uh, besides this FITCH project and the surveillance of the SARS-CoV-2. We are uh, we are having some other uh, uh, projects as well, which I uh, which I will show you. But in uh, 2020, uh, uh, faced by this pandemic, so global health security is challenged up, and and it gives us the opportunity uh, to the uh, uh, developing countries and low and middle income countries to uh, uh, to have uh, some uh, use open source uh, capacity building in areas like sequencing and bioinformatics. So we uh, uh, so we approach for this uh, low hanging fruits. We approach for this. Uh, uh, opportunity but still uh, uh, we have some challenges for example uh, if you are going to build a platform for sequencing and bioinformatics uh, suppose uh, for, for the pathogen genomic surveillance and for the uh, 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 to have some public health genomic uh, initiative, uh, we have uh, we had a lack of training opportunities, a, a lack of school staff for both wet lab and dry lab, and uh, uh, for uh, and the uh, and the biggest hurdle uh, for uh, for Pakistan right now that we have uh, uh, we are have, we are struggling with the available uh, with the av availability or procurement of sequencing reagents. Uh, and the next thing is the bioinformatics infrastructure. So there are two things in uh, for this bioinformatics uh, uh, structure not only to develop the bioinformatics structure, but also to maintain it so that it can be used for public health informatics strategies as well. And, uh, and, and, and the collection of metadata so that you can highly utilize your sequencing data to answer or to inform public health policies and, uh, and, and to government uh, uh, agencies to predict early the uh, early the emerging of new strains or the, uh, or the uh, surviving strains in your local population. So we sorted out some solutions. Uh, why don't we use crowdsource uh, funding within our existing grants to build both sequencing and bioinformatics ex uh, 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 expertise and to use uh, this uh, funding further for uh, to train our lab technicians, lab managers, and the bioinformaticians. So, uh, uh, so we foster some international and external collaborations. Uh, uh, especially, I would like to mention here uh, our uh, partners, uh, Jane Zuckerberg Biohub, uh, our FACE partners, and uh, our uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation partners. Uh, and we also foster some internal co collaborations uh, with our clinical and pathology department, with AQ Data Center, uh, and uh, with our uh, uh, IDRL Infectious Diseases Research Lab that comes under the uh, uh, supervision of the Department of Pediatrics and Child Health, and with National Institute of Health, Pakistan. Uh, so, uh, so all these grants help us to improve uh, uh, or to establish uh, uh, our uh, to establish the bioinformatics and sequencing core. Uh, so, uh, so this uh, 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 multi-mix for mother and, and infants from grants from Pakistan help us to uh, uh, to, stab uh, to establish and strengthen our wet lab. Uh, the chain Zuckerberg Biohub, uh, 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 Caesar Biohub uh, um, uh, grant uh, won by our colleague, uh, our, uh, our doctor uh, Imran Nisar. Uh, from our department and uh, under the Grand Challenges Exploration GCE grant uh, to discover new childhood infections in archive uh, 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 nasopharyngeal samples. Uh, and, and from this CZ by uh, grant, we procured uh, our Illumina IC100 sequencer as well. Uh, so these are the some uh, some 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 establishment that we perform. Uh, so under the uh, 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 grants, uh, we receive uh, this uh, Roche Magnapore instrument, uh, the uh, highly uh, sophisticated and automatic DNA extractor, 
And uh, once you restrict your DNA, then you need to check the quality control and the uh, yield of DNA. So we just procured the, uh, our Agilent tape station. So it is an Illumina uh, IC100 system, the world's smallest bench step sequencer, and it is specific, ideal uh, uh, for the microbiome sequencing uh, uh, right now from the Illumina. And then we uh, have uh, strengthened our bioinformatics, established and strengthened further our bioinformatics part. So uh, we purchased two workstations and uh, that have uh, uh, three terabyte of hard disk space, uh, 96 uh, core machines with 64 GB RAM. And we have our server, which is maintained by AQ data team. And that uh, server has 160 ports machine with 132 GB RAM. Uh, so overall we have 10 terabytes of hard disk space supported by further 40 terabytes of external hard disk drive uh, from the uh, a direct, uh, as a direct attachment storage device. Uh, so to stand in uh, uh, further, uh, apart from uh, all these uh, uh, sharing of grants, so we are in much uh, better, you can say, capable position to strengthen further our public health genomics under the consortium uh, of FAGE. So uh, uh, when we won the grant as a sub awardee from the University of the Cape Town uh, FAGE Secretariat, so, uh, uh, so we uh, successfully sequenced three batches with uh, 40 samples of SARS-CoV-2 at Illumina IC100 uh, uh, following the Arctic version three protocol. Uh, and this data is analyzed by our newly deployed command line interface of uh, uh, mini uh, uh, mini workflow description language ID seeks by informatics pipeline to generate SARS-CoV-2 consensus genome assemblies. Uh, so uh, uh, just a little overview about this uh, uh, ID seek pipeline, which is uh, uh, owned by the CZ uh, Biohub. So these are the basic steps and the data analysis workflow. So uh, once you have this pipeline installed onto your workstation or onto your server, so you don't need to install every software by itself. So it is a complete pipeline starting from the first queue and at the end of the day, you have uh, VCFI. So it starts with the host filtering and quality control. So uh, itself, it has multiple uh, softwares and tools and this whole IDC pipeline works as a suite of software where all these uh, work, uh, all these tools uh, uh, work in harmonized or in aligned way so that uh, you don't need to install each software separately. So after the filtering criteria, you have assembly based alignment, uh, whether you are doing metagenomics or whether you are doing uh, SARS-CoV-2 genome consensus assembly. So uh, you have this assembly based alignment, which is uh, that you need to give your reference genome. So after the uh, alignment, you have this uh, taxonomic reporting of different species, but uh, if you're doing uh, SARS-CoV-2 genome assemblies, at the end of the day, you have your SARS-CoV-2 uh, genomes in the form of FASTA format. So there's a quick uh, 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 way how we install uh, the uh, uh, pipeline at our workstation, uh, and not in our workstation, but in our server as well, uh, 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 utilizing our existing uh, leveraging our existing infrastructure. So we use uh, uh, Docker to install our pipeline and there's a check how our pipeline tested using the Docker uh, container. So once uh, the test is, uh, was, uh, was successful, so we run this pipeline. So it is a very, uh, uh, very robust pipeline and it needs only uh, your, uh, if your sequencing data is coming from the parent, end, so it has two files first, uh, R1 and R2. So you just need to mention your files, uh, which technology you are using because IDC uh, mini middle pipeline is also uh, work for third generation uh, sequencing protocol. For example, if someone, sequencing the data from the ONT, the export nanopore. So you need to change uh, uh, for technology from Illumina to ONT. So uh, after running this pipeline, the whole, uh, 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 so uh, it has the uh, workflow description language script, which is known as WDL. And you need to input your parameters over here, which is known as local test.yml file. So once you input your parameters in YAML file, it takes uh, all your input uh, specification and configuration from YAML file, uh, runs this uh, pipeline on the cloud. And at the end of the day, you have this consensus uh, file, muscle output file, BAM file, uh, and uh, along with this, some calling file, report file, and depth file. And this depth file has your coverage, how well your physically breadth your coverage uh, reference genome has, has been co covered from your sample. And um, in the report.tsv, how, um, uh, uh, how well your DNA is read in the form of the depth. 
so uh, uh, let me uh, uh, include, let me take you our uh, experience of for first sequencing uh, uh, batch. Uh, so once we have received this, this data from the lab, uh, so uh, uh, we have uh, two uh, uh, two considerations. One is the, uh, we observed the uh, problem of mixed site criteria, for example, on any one side, you have mixed site. For example, you have uh, ambiguous code uh, uh, where the sequencer is uh, uh, is confused, uh, not able to put any A, G, C, or Qs rather than to put R. And R, as we know, it stands for A or G. So um, uh, it is red if mixed sites are more than 10, uh, yellow for more than two, uh, as per next clade criteria, and green if mixed site is uh, less than or equal to two. So once you have this uh, 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 criteria, uh, you go for correcting mix, uh, mixed site. So we don't have genius. Uh, uh, or any other uh, commercial software. So, uh, so we ad adopted a very simple strategy. Uh, for example, uh, we use the grep command to uh, to got all the ambiguous code. And once we have all this ambiguous code, the next step is to find the position of all these uh, ambiguous code positions uh, 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 in your constructed genome. So we use uh, for this purpose mega software and uh, to, uh, to identify the frequency of nucleotide using IGV. So according to the I, uh, IDC frequency uh, parameter, so if you have more than 0 0.2, 0.9%, uh, percent that uh, uh, nucleotide should be called. So uh, right here, in this case, we have R ambiguous code. And for this R, we have either A or G. So for now, we have A, which is 90%. So we manually go into the consensus genome file, convert that R into A. So after an uh, next clear uh, result after QC, so we really perform uh, well uh, in our quality control. So we submit our data considering all the mandatory uh, considering all the mandatory requirement of the of the phase four consortium, all the yellow fields in the Excel file. And uh, we also submit our data to uh, GISAID, NCBS, GenBank, and SRA. So uh, so from Pakistan, we are the first one to submit our sequence data archive, raw sequencing data in the form of OSCE file uh, uh, from the Khan University. Uh, so that in future people can use to benchmark any other studies as well. Uh, so uh, 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 last weekend we also put genomic. Uh, we also put Pakistan on the genomic epidemiology map at Next Strain. So we successfully deployed our build uh, uh, at Next Strain. So basically, that tree is built from 906 sequences. Uh, so we uh, took data uh, last week. So at the time, it has 1200 sequences, and after our filtering step, we have 906 sequences. And we plan to update this monthly, but we are discussing right now. So maybe we reduce this time for uh, for a week or so. So this is the genomic epidemiology map of Pakistan uh, categorized by CLID. And as you can see, uh, although we lack a good number of genomic sequencing data early, but now we are in much better position to infer uh, the uh, the prospective date of uh, Delta variant and so many other uh, variants into that uh, CLID. So, uh, so this is our first uh, uh, initiative from the uh, Citric Center for Bioinformatics at Aga Khan University. And here, as you can see, said we are representing the national data set as far as genomic epidemiology of SARS-CoV-2 is concerned. Uh, okay. So, so this is the divergence map, uh, and this is the number of mutations map, uh, and we have uh, somewhere here. So uh, right now, uh, at least we have a good number of, uh, you can say, uh, mutations uh, almost starting from the reference genome till now. So uh, in our uh, 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 in our country, so more or less we have 45 mutations. We are observing, and I think it will go further. Uh, well, so we're, we're uh, just running uh, out of time. Sorry, if you can, yeah, so that we yeah, can get sure. a question or two. I'm wrapping Thanks. up. Sorry. Uh, so, uh, so as you see, so earlier we have uh, uh, 20A uh, in our first wave, and right now in uh, fourth wave we have a good uh, uh, COVID-19 of 21J Delta variants, and I think it's uh, more than 90% uh, right now. Uh, so, uh, so we are uh, also uh, uh, as far as genomic sequencing data is concerned, the estimation rate uh, right now is to be 4.165 substitutions per year, which is close to the global uh, 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 substitution rate as well. Uh, so publications from Pakistan. Uh, so we have some publications from Pakistan. For example, this uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 genome sequencing of just one sample uh, from MySeq 
perform in Pakistan as well. So we have uh, uh, some uh, uh, sequencing uh, that uh, has uh, uh, four samples and that has five samples. And the five sample papers uh, from the NIH Islamabad at the ONP. And the, this plus one is also from NIH. Uh, and this one is also from at the Illumini C100. So we have contributed our share uh, in this. Uh, so uh, I apologize if I missed any of the new publications because I filtered the data on the basis of SARS-CoV-2 genome sequencing from the NGS technologies uh, on the basis of peer review publication only. So our vision uh, is to create a consortium of investigators with uh, clinical, epidemiological, and analytical uh, to work together towards uh, all these common goals. So the conclusion is to uh, the environment is quite uh, exciting nowadays to build uh, capacity in bioinformatics and, se and sequencing. So we are leveraging existing resources and we are building upon new. So uh, uh, the take home message is collaborate, uh, uh, whether it's internal collaboration or external collaboration. And we uh, actively seeking funding, even uh, a little goes a long way. So thanks, uh, I'm available at uh, Twitter. This is my email address. And we are constantly updating our GitHub page and we will uh, document all our protocol as part of our phase guidelines uh, at our uh, GitBook page as well. Uh, you will find our research group uh, at uh, uh, Aga Khan website. And thanks to my uh, uh, to my fabulous and fantastic team, my mentors and collaborators, uh, Dr. Nisar and Dr. Fadaja, uh, our young and smart uh, uh, bioinformatician Samia, and our lab manager for now. Thank you very much. Thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, so for, yeah, I, I know we haven't got much time, but if anyone has a burning question, please put it in the Q&A. In the meantime, um, I just wanted to ask a question around, um, uh, you mentioned about the cost. Um, have you managed to reduce cost? Um, are you plan I presume that you're still planning to go for domestic sequencing or are you sending samples out? I wondered if you could talk a bit about the challenge of that. Yeah, so right now we are sequencing locally uh, in our uh, uh, Jumma Research Lab at Al Khan University and under this uh, JRL we have this IDRL, Infectious Diseases Research Lab at Al Khan University. So we are sequencing locally at our Illumina IC100 uh, and uh, we started with just one sequencing batch with 10 samples, but now we are pulling samples. So we are decreasing samples locally and internally. So uh, in future, uh, we have uh, more samples to sequence and yes, the sequencing cost locally uh, will be low in future, yeah. Okay, great. And and um, I just want to ask, in terms of the submission to GISAID and so on, um, do you have any political constraints over the ability to share data? Um, has that been a challenge for you um, or not? Thanks. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, uh, so uh, uh, being being a bioinformatician, so I always believe in uh, open access. And if you are working uh, in endemic or pandemic state, and if you are working in genomic epidemiology, so uh, we don't have any uh, conflict or uh, or any specific uh, strain, whether uh, political or research it is. So, uh, uh, so uh, all data uh, uh, have been approved by the ethical review board and everything. So uh, we are good to sequence our data open uh, in the form of open access. Yeah. And we are doing this already. Great, thank you. Um, I can't see any other questions. So um, uh, I was just gonna ask one last question if I could around the metadata issue, which um, I'm based in Zambia and um, we also have a challenge around it. Uh, do you have any kind of advice or thoughts on um, how you can improve metadata to ensure that you, know, you can really get the most impact from, from this sequencing work? Yeah, so as far as uh, uh, the collection of metadata is concerned, so being uh, a PI, so I think it is one of the uh, main responsibility of PI to uh, to take a look uh, uh, about the collection of metadata. And if you are collecting the data from the, clin uh, from the clinical lab, so uh, the uh, the uh, field workers, uh, if you're collecting data from the field or from the lab, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the clinical fellow should be uh, vigilant. And if you have any uh, problem afterwards, you can uh, follow up uh, with the calls or emails or any sort of contact so that uh, if any basic uh, uh, field is missing, for example, just like age or male uh, or, or gender, so it should be fulfilled. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you ever so much. Um, so I believe that um, yeah, people can still submit questions um, to respond to. Um, you can see the connection details for um, uh, Wakas here. And um, I believe in the chat was the uh, um, Twitter handle for uh, Anita. Thank you both for a wonderful talk. Sorry to those who we've uh, overstayed our welcome slightly, but there was a lot to get through. Um, thank you very much for joining us today um, and look forward to the next um, Phage talk um, in a few weeks. Thanks. Thank Thanks. you.